Hello and welcome back to the Rope Access and Climbing Podcast. I'm your host, Mikey Stevenson, and today I'm joined with a special guest, Kristen, who is a professional arborist from Ontario. Today we're talking about her experience as a female arborist here in Canada. So if this is your first time here, please make sure to subscribe and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. So stay tuned. Step into your harness and get ready for a podcast about the vertical world. All right. So thank you very much for tuning into today's episode. I am joined here with... Kirsten Locke. Yeah. Where are you from? I am from London, Ontario. All right. And what is it that you do? I am an arborist and specifically a climber. A climber. Okay. So what does that mean? And t- except for like, are we climbing, uh, obviously climbing trees, but I mean, like... <laughs> I, mean I like to climb everything. All right. Um, in that aspect. But yeah, with, as regards to an arborist, I'm a, I'm a tree climber. Um, as an arborist, there's so many different roles that you can have. Um, so I, I kind of started out on the ground then worked my way up to climbing and I've been climbing for a couple of years now and I love it. All right. So what brings you out to Alberta? Like, Yes, we're in Alberta right now. She's from Ontario. So what brings you here? Um, The big thing that first brought me here was the mountains. I, Like I said, I'm a climber. I love to climb. I love the mountains. They've kind of been calling me for the last few years. And then I thought it would be a great opportunity to work with some other companies and see what it's like working out here. So I've started contract climbing, which has been really cool. Um, So I've worked with a couple of different companies so far and... um, yeah, just looking to get some new experience climbing in different areas as an arborist and also get out climbing in those mountains. <laughs> Excellent. And on that note, like uh, once we're done recording this, we're actually going to head out and do some ice climbing. So <laughs> <laughs> let's get that done. All right. Um, so how long have you been um, working in the arborist industry um, from when you started to here we are today? Yeah, it's been a few years. I um, kind of how I came into the industry was it was actually pretty funny. And an arborist came into my neighbor's yard to quote a tree, and they were actually at the wrong place. And so my partner went and chatted with him, and then he got a job working with the guy because he needed some help. And so after a while, they needed some more help, and they were like, "Do you want to come out and give us a hand one day on the ground?" And I was working full time as a nurse. And came out, helped, and was like, oh, my God, I love this. Like, I need to quit nursing. Like, I I knew with nursing, I thought I kind of wanted to be, like, an expedition medic or, like, do outdoor nursing. But it was more so the outdoors that I really loved. Um, so I started doing both. I was working with this company for a while on the ground and then doing nursing. And then um, after some time, um, my partner and I decided to start our own company. We definitely... We kind of caught on pretty quick with like having a a background in rock climbing, Um, the rope skills and all that stuff we kind of had a good handle on. So then I quit nursing and went full time into our company working and it just got, it took off. It got so busy and then, yeah, that's kind of where I am in today. (laughs) It's kind of a long answer. No, no, that's (laughs) awesome. So now you are certified ISA arborist. Mm -hmm. Um, now when did that kind of come about? So like you started your company, you didn't, you kind of just made it work, um, fake it till you make it kind of thing. It sounds like, um, but then obviously you kind of fell into the industry and took it a little bit more seriously and got your ISA certification. Kind of let me, uh, run us through that kind of process. Yeah. So with your ISA, you either have to go to school or have so many hours of experience, um, so after I had my hours, I um, I studied for my exam and, um, you know, I, I kind of, I'm very good at teaching myself in that sense. And I passed my exam and I'm still continuing to learn. Like um, I was talking with another arborist recently where like the ISA, it's really great to have, but it's still very much like a starting place. Like you're, you're always continuing to learn as an arborist. There's... Um, 
things are constantly evolving and changing and it's something you definitely want to like keep up with and keep teaching yourself and keep learning and keep practicing so yeah <laughs> yeah that that's fair like obviously everybody here on my platform knows that uh i'm in the rope access industry a little bit in the mountaineering side of things but have absolutely no experience in the arb industry so this is obviously something new for me um so like you know I don't know the the starts or where to start or how to get started in this industry. And I guess maybe we'll answer some of those questions as we uh, progress on here. But um, yeah, great. Thanks. Um, what do you like most about your job? Um, so my, my favorite thing being an arborist right now is I love pruning really large um, canopy trees. I think it's so special to have a role in actually promoting the longevity of trees, especially like big trees that contribute so much to our world. And they're, they're just so important. And to be able to, you know, remove deadwood or do structural pruning or to make an impact after storm damage and actually keep trees living longer and healthier and to be able to have them around. I think that's super special, especially when like, I really like the times too where I've had the opportunity to do like a climbing assessment of trees to see if um, a tree, like doing a risk assessment to see if it needs to stay or if it needs to go. For example, there was a tree that had been struck by lightning and a few companies had told this homeowner that, oh, there's a crack, the tree should come out. And after getting in it, I could see that the wound had actually like closed over really well. And the tree definitely would benefit from some pruning to remove like any deadwood and to have cabling done just to promote, um, to help with the structure of it. But the tree didn't need to come out. And I think that is something I love when you can actually like educate people and keep trees longer. Um, sometimes people don't like to do that because then it's an ongoing thing of like monitoring this tree. And especially with cabling, you need to check them every year, but why not keep trees around if we can? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love I love trees so much and I love uh, I love the trimming side of, of big trees where you can do like big technical rigging, which is super fun, but like you get to keep the tree and you're not just cutting it down. Yeah, I, I think that any time that I've encountered this conversation with other people in the industry is just like, there's the difference between the uh, somebody that's trying to prolong its life and then just like the other person that just shows up and just like, nope, just cut it down, get rid of it. And, you know, obviously there's a lot to that goes into m being able to make that assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's where that education and knowledge um, really benefits you moving forward and, and you have that expertise in that subject matter expert side of things where people can kind of relate or try to relate um to understand what you're trying to get at right like you're if you're walking into a client's house or whatever and they're like what do we do um you know show up with a little bit of confidence and understand what you're talking about mm -hmm. it's really going to go a long way how have you found working in this industry as a female oh boy yeah so this was a big challenge at first um okay. Yeah, I found it. I mean, at first I was I was on the ground a lot and my partner was always the one climbing. So I think at the start, too, there was a bit of maybe a bit of jealousy and also like a bit of insecurity of being like, oh, I wish I was the one climbing. And it's always like he's a guy and he gets to climb. People always assume he's the one climbing. And it was a bit a bit tough at first there. But I I kind of worked my way up to climbing bigger trees and, you know, started with like learning how to fell trees, doing a small spruce removal and, and slowly worked my way up to the point where we now take every other day climbing. Mm -hmm. um, but even once we were completely sharing the load of like all the big trees, all the hazardous trees, all the technical trees, for a while it was like assumed that he was the one climbing, he was the one doing all the work. Like I was always in charge of um, the admin stuff as well. So like I didn't, I do, we do the phone calls and people would be like, oh yeah, just tell me when your guy's here to do the quote. Tell me when you're, when the guy is here to do the work. And I'd be like, we will both be there. And like they, sometimes people would like completely disregard me. Right. Um, 
And I got quite angry, I think, for a little bit. And then I feel like once I shifted my attitude to being like, I actually fully believe in myself. I am worthy. I deserve it. I kick butt. I can do this. I feel like I don't get that attitude as much to right. me, which is kind of interesting. So like online, I used to get a lot of comments sometimes of people being like, oh, your hair is too long or you can't do that or you're not doing that right. And like people just being, it almost seemed like they were harder on me because I was a female. Mm -hmm. But once I kind of like stopped focusing on it and just like let it go and started to really believe in myself, it seemed to be like I, I just got less of those comments. Right. So it's kind of interesting. So I think I think the big thing is just like know your worth, believe in yourself and people will support you. The right people will find you and will support you. And regardless of you're male or female or any gender, yeah. um, you can do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, for, you know, the females out there that, you know, are listening to this, is there something that you would tell them kind of advice? Because like, there's obviously in all industries, it doesn't have to be this industry or the rope industry or any, it's everything. Um, there's usually some sense of insecurity. Yeah. Um, and is, is what would you tell them listening to this? Like what would be a, some sort of advice for them to kind of move past that line of like not starting because of the insecurity or? Yeah, I, I think part of it comes down to like your own self work and your own like mental space of like, believing in yourself and reflecting on your feelings and working through them and knowing that it's totally okay to be scared. It's totally okay to be nervous. It's totally okay to feel left out or worried or whatever your fears are. Like it's completely okay. You're not alone. And everyone has those feelings. Like I used to think that like a lot of guys like just never got scared or nervous, but I've met so many people now that actually are like, yeah, like when it's a super big, dead, sketchy tree, I'm nervous as hell. And I'm like, oh, wow, you feel that way? Like, I thought so many people just like are super confident and don't have any nerves. But it's like, no, everyone gets scared. Everyone has nerves. And I think a big thing, too, I would say is to find a support system. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be like necessarily people in the ARB industry, like chat with like your girlfriends, your guy friends, your partners, your family like whoever and like be with people that like tell you like you are awesome you can do this you got this because it's helpful like to tell yourself that but then to also be supportive with people who believe in you it really like it, it can be really helpful so and if you don't necessarily have friends who understand like reach out to someone else in the industry like I always say like if you're I mean male or female but definitely a lot of females will message me and be like have ask questions or share their feelings and I'll do my best to like answer people mm -hmm. and um, provide support because it's so important because I definitely felt like when I was starting I felt pretty alone in that because we were running our company during COVID like the pandemic and um, I had such simple questions that I wanted to ask other women and I couldn't find anyone I didn't know anyone and I was nervous to reach out online I just wanted to like get together with someone in person and be like these are my questions like am I crazy or like yeah and it was so hard to find that and I felt like pretty alone for the first bit so um there's some really cool events now that the world's kind of opening back up again that yeah. um I got the chance to like meet with some other women and it's been so rad like there are awesome people out there and yeah you can totally do it <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what would be your biggest challenge in the industry so far? And how did you overcome those challenges? Yeah, I, there, there's a few. Like, I think the biggest challenge is is the mental aspect. Because I think that that's often the thing that holds us back. Like, a lot of times, like, we yeah. may have the knowledge or and we may have the skill. But if you're not there mentally, you're not confident, you don't believe in yourself, you're scared, like you'll be hesitant or you won't put yourself out there. You won't take that step. And, um, I think, I think being nervous about things has been my biggest challenge. Like I've at first maybe kind of opted out of wanting to do certain projects or kind of took the back seat and things at times and kind of let other people be the leader. Um, but, and that comes down to some of the things I was saying before yeah. about like doing your own self work yeah. and like having confidence. And, mm -hmm, yeah. Starting to, and like, 
believing in yourself and practicing believing in yourself and um, having those people that support you, like, that's kind of how, and I think that's something that you're, you're never like there. Like, it's never like, oh, I'm confident now and I can do anything. It's like, it's always a, a process of like discovering yourself, believing in yourself, practicing confidence, understanding when it's a good time to back out, when it's a good time to push forward. And that's something that we have throughout our whole life. But um, yeah. I'm grateful for that challenge. Like, that's something I, I love about climbing in general. It's like, it's such a mental aspect. Like, I know I'm strong physically, but it's always the mental that gets me. But that's that's the awesome thing when you can push through that and get yeah. into like a flow state. It's just, it's awesome. <clears throat> and on that note, like, don't be afraid to fail. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that nobody likes to fail. I know that hearing no is not the answer you want, but some of my personal growth has been by my biggest failures. Yeah. Um, and I'm mis I think that, that stands true with anybody out there is, you know, you got to put yourself out there. You got to try new things and you know, it's okay to fail and understand that you can grow so much more by failing mm -hmm. um, and not be scared of it. And it it's kind of teaches us what, what we, what we don't know or the things that we need to work on or what's actually important to us by going down those different paths or yeah. failing or making mistakes. Like, yeah. And be humble and understand that you don't know what you don't know. Like, yeah, the, uh, that is a huge thing that a lot of people forget about. It's just like, I'm in this industry I'm, or whatever the industry is. And I am the person that everyone's relying on to have the answer. And, but sometimes you don't have those answers and it's okay to not have the answers. The key point is being able to find the answer, but yeah. don't blow smoke up someone's butt. Just straight up be like, I don't have the answer like off the top of my head. I will get it back. I'll, I'll get back to you and I'll, I'll find out what you're looking for. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a big thing too with tree climbing is like the stakes are high with regards to your life and then um, the targets that are around like houses, yeah, utility lines or power lines or garages or vehicles or other people or animals like there's a lot going on so it's always better like there's nothing wrong with running your ideas by someone or, or clarifying or asking for other opinions like there's there's lots of times where I'll be like what do you think about this this is my idea but and then maybe we'll go back and forth with like some ideas or talk things through because it's it's just nice to have other opinions and there yeah there's nothing wrong with um asking for what other people think and sit admitting like i don't know if this is the best idea what do you think like yeah absolutely um what does it mean to you to be an arborist in this country um i haven't got that question before it's kind of a hard thing to to answer um like i've only ever worked in canada as an arborist i would love to work down in the states but I think, I think it's more so like what does it mean to be an arborist to you personally and I think to each each arborist that'll be different mm -hmm. because being an arborist you can, there's people who climb trees and there's arborists who've never climbed a tree or never worked a chainsaw and like people who do plant health care, people who do sales or people who do, uh, there's so many jobs as an arborist that I am not even aware of yet. Um, so to me and this is I think just what being an arborist to me means is balancing doing what's best for trees and people mm -hmm. because I truly value trees and I I always want to do what's best for trees but sometimes when it comes down to people's budgets and things like they might not have the budget necessarily to, to do the type of prune that may be required for this tree so I always keep what's in the best interest for trees as like a a top priority to me like if if a homeowner were to or even a a company were to ask me to like just top a tree for no reason other than like the homeowner just wants them topped like I'm not going to do that mm -hmm. because unless it's unless you're topping because mm -hmm. like you're doing reduction cuts or you're removing a diseased part of the tree or there's a certain reason that's going to be helpful for the tree like I don't ever want to do something that's going to be like harmful or damaging to trees and that's still something I'm balancing when it comes to like if someone wants to remove trees for no other reason I, I'll always do my best to like educate and understand as to why because 
maybe some people just don't know and they think something's wrong with it or think it's too big or maybe there's other other ideas. So being an arborist to me is just sharing my love for trees and continuing to learn and continuing to teach that to to anyone, other people and yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um so name one item that you can't go without that is excluding PPE and obviously your chainsaw because I don't know how much you can do without a chainsaw doing your job. So <laughs> Yeah, oh my gosh, I have like so many things coming to mind. I don't really know how I can pick one thing. <laughs> All right, all right. Um, how, how about make a short list? Like, okay. Let's go with the short okay, list. I like this. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so obviously you would have like your chainsaw, your helmet, your harness, your boots. I think like we were talking about yeah. before we recorded this, um, that having proper boots makes such a big difference. Um, like I used to have like just cheap work boots and I felt like super insecure in the tree. I felt like I would slip around more. My spurs didn't fit in very well with them. And then ever since I got, like, my Scaffolite boots by ArborTech, my spurs literally, like, lock into my boot. It's like my spur is, like, one with my boot. I feel so much more confident, so much more safe. And, like, that always sets you up to work better, work safer, work smarter, work faster. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, good boots, I always, I always say to people, is super important. Um, I also would want to always have my own climbing line and my own lanyard just because you don't know what other companies um like what what type of wear has been on these ropes like you can do a visual inspection but you don't know how long they've been used if there's been any loads on these ropes if they've been cleaned improperly like your life is literally on like your lanyard in your lifeline so i want to have full control over knowing what they've been through so is that something that is um, common? So say like you go and work for somebody um, else, do they provide that stuff normally? Or is this stuff that like in your industry, is it pretty normal to just take your kit and just go job to job, job to job? I don't know how that works. Like obviously with rope access under the IRATA scheme that we're under, all our equipment is provided. But right. like for yeah. you, how does that work? Yeah, I guess that's true. And that's probably from me just coming from always having my own gear. I just have always appreciated that. Um, and I think, too, as a contract climber, you can do it without gear or with your gear. But I, a lot of the people that I know have their own gear. And it's kind of easier, I think, to get jobs that way because then you can kind of just be hired on to a company and just you can just get to the job and go. You don't need to like use their saws or their ropes or any of their, their stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people, I know a lot of people who even like keep their own, their own rigging ropes, their own rigging gear and stuff, just cause they know everything that it's been through. Um, if you're, if you're employed by a company, I think a lot of companies would provide that stuff for you. But I mean, if you are using other companies things, I think it's always a good conversation to have like, so what's the wear of this gear like? What's it's been used for? How long have you had it? And like always do a good inspection of it. Because even if you're working for another company and you're using their rigging ropes and something fails, like I, I would never want to be in that scenario. Like that sounds awful. But I don't know what that would come down to. Like yeah. you're it in the end, you're responsible for your own work. So yeah. you should be inspecting the things that you're using. Absolutely. But um, so yeah, going back to the question, sorry to <laughs> divert there, yeah, no, but that's cool. um, <laughs> I think it was, a, it just kind of obviously came up, but I mean, like going back to this, so we're talking boots, we're talking lanyards, we're talking lifelines. Those are absolute necessities and things that you can't go without. Is there anything else? Or um, is... I think something that I can't go without, but it's not a piece of gear though, but oh. it's super, super important. Um, not your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, what? Kind of update the Instagram, right? No. <laughs> I don't. I, I sometimes will have my phone with me, but a lot of the times I don't. Actually, snacks. That's a big thing. That wasn't oh. even what I was going to say. Oh. But I, I will definitely have my snacks with me over my phone. I think having snacks is super important. And I actually have water with me all the time. A lot of people, I used to get a lot of people online being like, you're taking the kitchen sink with you up in the, in the tree. Because I have like a water bottle clipped to me and stuff. Yeah. But I'm like, gosh. 
especially if you work somewhere where it's super humid and it's in the summer. Ontario? Having a liter of water with you isn't even enough. Like, you probably need at least three of those. You sweat a liter of water out just getting up into the canopy in Ontario. If you start cramping (laughs) up in the tree or you're super dehydrated and having headaches, it gets to the point where you're, like, hypoglycemic and, like, wanting to pass out. Like, that's not safe. And you're not going to be working as well. Like, I I noticed that sometimes I would get in the tree and I – after like so many hours, I'd start to get like bad headache, pretty grumpy and be like, oh, I just want to get the fuck out of this tree. Like, okay, just, <laughs> oh, like just so irritated. I'm like, oh, food. I'm getting hangry. Yeah. And like ever since I started keeping it like snacks with me and then once I, I would maybe if there's a good point where I'm kind of waiting for the ground people to like clean something up, I'll be like, okay, cool. This is great snack time. Yeah. But if I start to get like that headache or like bit irritated, I'm like, oh, okay, I need some food. Cause sometimes I don't really get the hunger sensation. Sometimes when I'm like really active. Oh yeah. So having food, um, I was actually like a game changer. Like yeah. I was able to like do super long days and at the end of the day feel good. Yeah. Which then says you have to go back and do it the next day. Got to fuel your body. Yeah. Absolutely. So water, water, and healthy snacks, not just like a fucking bag of lollipops or. Oh come candy. on! <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. I like get the sugar I, high like, going. Like healthy snack bars, or like yeah. I'll bring up like beef jerky and like I tend to actually bring like baby food because uh, it's really easy to have in my pack. So it's like fruits and veggies, just like pepperettes or something. So yeah. you got like your protein and a bit of carbs mm. or. Yeah. Something like there's only so much you can bring up in your pocket. Um, I'm I'm a huge fan of um like triscuits, like crackers mm. because you know, it's the carbs, right? Get those carbs into your body, get get you fueled, get that sugar going. And that's what keeps me going. Like I can do long, long days and have no care in the world, but I'll just have like a little bag, Ziploc bag of triscuits and just kind of pick away at them all day long. P- like I can go to an entire Alpine road, go a full day and not actually stop for a break where everyone's like, oh, we have to take lunch. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm good. Like, because, you know, every, you know, couple minutes you take one cracker and you just keep going. You're fueling your day, your body throughout the entire day instead of just like periodically when you're like, oh, I'm hungry. I need to stop. And yeah, eat. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think, I think each person definitely, <clears throat> I think it's good to practice and like figure out what you um, function best on because like I on the other hand know that if I'm not eating enough protein I cr- I crash okay even if I like eat consistently like I'm just a person that needs a lot of protein and, that's like, fair. good quality proteins so, like yeah. I will have like grass-fed beef jerky with me or like if it's really cold out sometimes I would even bring like frozen ground beef <laughs> or so, something okay. like I don't know like I I, I, I need that like along with having having carbs. Otherwise, I like I find that I, I crash tank really yeah. well. Um, so, yeah, food is definitely a big. But the thing I was actually going to say that I literally can't do without is um, like m- mobility and like a movement practice. OK, um, if I just wake up, have coffee, have breakfast and go to work, I end up feeling more sore out of alignment my back my low back will be will be sore sometimes to the point where I might like be more prone to hurt myself um pull something like just end up kind of feeling like crap at the end of the day whereas if I even just take like 20 minutes and do some like alignment with like my pelvis activate my muscles do like actually like a warm-up for my day I find I get to work I'm ready to go my body's warmed up I'm not dragging my feet I feel really good. I feel really strong. I move well and I can then do it better the next day. So that, that made a huge difference for me because my first year climbing, I felt sore all the time. I was just like wrecked. My body hurt. I couldn't rock climb. I didn't want to do anything. Like I constantly had like this pain in my shoulder from like always like pull starting the saw. And I had like so many overuse injuries I felt like going on. But once I, even though it might seem like you're adding another thing, but it's not strength training in the sense of like going and deadlifting 200 pounds before work. It's like, it's just it's, mobility. It's like mobility and yeah. body weight, range of motion exercises and doing like some strength training exercises, but they're, they're more low intensity. The, the load on your body isn't very high. They're more so to get your body like ready to work. And yeah. that has made like the biggest difference for me. And I always like, even now, like that I'm contract climbing and I'm in new places, like I will get up early, get myself to the gym really quickly or 
do some stuff in my van, do it outside. Like I will not go to work without taking care of my body because I will pay for it later. And I don't want to be like 10 years down the road being like, I can't climb anymore or like my body hurts or. Yeah. Yeah. Your body is, that's all we got. That's how we live this life is yeah. with this body. So we got to take care of it. May as well, might as well take care of it today. Yeah. Because it's, we can't do it all, all the time. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, thank you. That's all I have. Is there anything you want to add to this? Um, hmm, I think I've said most of the important things of just like <laughs> taking care of your body is huge, regardless, I think of your industry. And I, I mean, whatever you do in life, it's, you should take care of your body, but especially when you're doing something physical, if you want to continue to do that work, taking care of your body is huge. Plus take care of like your mental health and stuff. Like mental health is a huge part of, of everything. But like, I, I found that like, that was my biggest challenge with, with climbing. So, um, looking after yourself yeah. yeah it's really important and believing in yourself like you can do it you can do anything you want with your life absolutely yeah all right well on that note we're gonna be out of, uh we're gonna get out of here and go do some ice climbing yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you very much all right well thank you everyone for tuning in to today's episode that was a great time um obviously this is my first in-person interview and to be honest like there's a massive difference between what we've been doing for the last two years here on this platform of doing interviews through Zoom. Um, so having the ability now to have some in-person uh, in person interviews, I'm super excited because that just is that much more personal and a little bit more you know, friendly and a little bit more fun. So if you like this, please make sure to hit the like button, share this with your friends, comment down below, let me know what you thought about it and maybe who I should interview next. All right. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe as it's down here in the bottom right hand corner, hit the bell for notifications when I put out new videos as I do try to put out new content every Sunday. So until next time.